Welcome everyone to Woodlawn Church. Uh, it's so good to have you with us. This week we are in the second week of a teaching series called Disciplines of the Disciple. Uh, before we move forward doing a whole lot, I want to just mention out there uh, that there's this great opportunity for you to stay in touch with everything that's happening. And that is for you to text me at the number that's on the screen. If you'll text me anything, what's going to happen for the, if you've never done it before is you'll immediately be texted back a little form. It'll give you a chance to give me your name and email address. And that way you get included on all of the communication that we do churchwide. Uh, for instance, yesterday at 7 p.m., we were able to text out, hey, don't forget that today's the big spring forward day, everyone's favorite Sunday of the year, right? So I, I want to ask, I want to ask, how many of you were like really disciplined and you went ahead and set your clocks ahead at like seven o'clock yesterday afternoon so that you went to bed an hour earlier than normal? Hands up. Where are the disciplined people at? Where are the disciplined people? Okay. Secondly, how many of you just went, I'm going to live life wild and crazy and I will not need that extra hour of sleep. I'm just going to spend, I'm going to stay up as late as I always do and I'm going to get up an hour early in the morning and go. Where are you people? Where where are you people? Look at them, judge them, look at them, judge them. No. Uh, okay. What about, where are those of you that are like, for the first time you thought, I, I found out that I was an hour late this morning. This morning I found out that it sprung forward and I had to rush and run and nobody going to admit that. Those will be the people walking in, in about 40 minutes. Okay. So feel free to lovingly make fun of them. Uh, that's it's family, right? We're a family. That's what we're supposed to do. So a couple of things that I want to just rewind, kind of rewind from last week, just to make sure you're not forgetting. We are in the midst of Lent. Not all of us, many of us are participating in that by giving something up. The whole idea when you fast is that you fast from food or from some other thing that you love and you feast on God. Fasting and feasting always go hand in hand, okay? Which is why for us, Easter is a feast day. It's a day to celebrate. It's a day to, to thrive to get excited to eat that chocolate or that chicken or drink that Coca-Cola or whatever it is that you gave up. We fast from food in order to feast from God. And we learned four quick things last week about fasting. We learned that fasting, the F stands for, we focus. We focus on God and all that he's done. So we're thinking things like, my life is different because Jesus died for my sins. My future is different because Jesus overcame death in the grave. I'm focusing on him. The A stands for attitude. Attitude is everything when it comes to fasting. You can't be looking around going, oh my gosh, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I just want that thing that I gave up and I can't have it. I can't stand that new preacher at our church who made me do this. Ugh. Attitude is everything. You're excited about focusing on God and learning from him and listening to him and giving up something doesn't seem quite so bad. So I'm going to give an example of that. One of the members of my family gave up sweets for Lent. I think that's really sweet of this person. It's really a cool thing to give up. And then what do you know? What do you know? We get snow in March. And when you live in Livingston County and you get snow in March, you make, come on city people, snow cream the best sweet there is. And I'm like to that person, look, it's, you can cheat. Like we didn't know it was going to snow in March. You know, like, like it's, you know, you could cheat. And this person said, no, no. I said, I was giving up sweets. I'm not going to do it. I'm like, proud of you. Proud of you. That's awesome. Very good. Attitude is everything. S stands for the spiritual function is inward. We're not doing this to prove some outward goal. We're not doing this to say, I did it. I did it. I set the goal and I did it. It's not an outward goal. It's an inward growth. That's what we're looking for. God is growing you on the inside. So let that happen as you fast. And ultimately, the last one is that fasting teaches us to, to trust God. It trains you to trust God, where you can get through the little things in life with him. Then when you face a big one, you can get through with that as well. So today we are in the second week of Disciplines of the Disciple, and it's time for us to talk about study. So before we even really get started, how many of you by show of hands would say, I love to study, like I enjoy studying. I genuinely like, and I'm not, I'm not even necessarily saying the Bible, just I like studying something. I like studying, growing, learning, different things. I like studying. Okay, I'm not going to ask the other group to raise your hand. It's okay if you don't like to study. Today's going to be hard on you, okay? But we're just going to talk about that and learn a little bit about what it means to study. I have to confess, I genuinely love studying 
studying, my, my typical MO is to pick up a new thing and then try to go learn everything about that new thing possible. And then once I feel like I've learned enough about it, I sometimes dump that and go get something else. Right now, I don't know why, it's blacksmithing. I just think that's really cool. I want to go to Gatlinburg. I want to make my own knife. I want to put that in my backpack and carry it with me. And I want to be able to say, I made that. I made that by myself with a hammer and an anvil and heat, and I did it. Like, I want to learn how to do that. So, so I, you walk into my house at a time when I don't have something going on. I'm watching Forged in Fire or some other TV show trying to learn about that. I bought the master class thing so that I could study on this thing and learn more about it. There's something fun and enjoyable about feeling like you're still growing and for me, at 48 years old, I'm still growing means I'm still young somehow, in some ways. Like, I'm still learning, I'm still developing, I'm still growing. That's the attitude that we take into today's message as we learn about the importance that God puts on the teaching of his word and therefore also uh, on the importance that God puts on the learning and the living of his word, okay? So let's move forward. I keep turning this thing off. It's got a little fidget thing on here and I turn it off. The text for today is 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2 is the, 2 Timothy is the last uh, book that we see written here by the Apostle Paul, most likely. Uh, most folks believe that that's, that's most likely true. Uh, and the history of this church where, where Timothy's working in Ephesus is this. I just wrote this down for you because it's such an important thing. And here's the reality. I, I probably had a master's degree in biblical studies before I really had anyone lay out the history of the Ephesian church to me in one line. I just had never really thought of it in one line like that. Let me just tell you how cool this is. The the church in Ephesus was launched as recorded in the 18th chapter of Acts, and it was launched by Apollos, but Apollos launched it under the baptism of John. So, so imagine John the Baptist prior to the, the death of Jesus is preaching and teaching repentance that people need to, that people need to uh, be repentant of God, be washed of their sin and be devoted, but still very much a Jewish perspective, like, a, like the, the baptism of John focused on repentance and devotion to, to God. Okay. Uh, Apollos goes to Ephesus and plants this church thinking about baptism in a way that's very John the Baptist kind of, kind of thought. Not long after, in, in chapter 18, you see Priscilla and Aquila, the married couple church planting team that do amazing things throughout the New Testament. They show up and they recognize that the baptism that's being taught by Apollos is kind of like last generation. You know when you get your iPhone or, or your Samsung phone and you've got it just the way you want it and then all of a sudden they come out with a new update and you have to, and you have to recognize the new update and it click the word upload and it, and it changes things on your phone and some of you love that. You're like, I got the newest and the best and the greatest. And others of you are like, why can't they just leave it the same way? right? Now I can't find my email anywhere. I don't know where it is. Uh, that's what's happening in a very practical way to Apollos. Apollos, with a great heart, like with like focused attention, shows up in Ephesus, plants a church, and then not long after that, Priscilla and Aquila show up with an upgrade. And the upgrade is the understanding that Jesus has died on the cross, has been risen from the grave, and that the baptism that we're, being, that we're experiencing is the baptism of Christ. So all of a sudden, things are growing, things are changing, things are developing. Shortly after that, the, the Apostle Paul shows up in Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul is teaching even more developed things, explaining in even greater ways to the church in Ephesus what it is that they need to know. It's important to get this because it's important to know that the first three transitions of leadership in Ephesus all had new developing teachings involved, which is a great way to breed confusion. And it happens. There's lots of confusion in Ephesus. Lots of people start to rise up as teachers. They start to argue about whether or not this is right or that is right. And I remember when I, was, I heard it this way and you're teaching it that way. And all of a sudden there was a bit of a division, also known as the Ephesian controversy, over some specific details. Paul stays there for a while, 
teaches them, brings most things to clarity, and then he leaves, and he leaves young Timothy, his young protege, to be the next pastor in Ephesus. And, and we know from First and Second Timothy that one of the great goals that Paul gave Timothy was to make sure that the theology stays straight and clear, continue to work through the confusing areas, and raise up other leaders, teach them well, and then give them the call or the sent, the, like send them out to continue that solid way of teaching. Make sure everybody gets what's going on. After this is all over, get this, after Timothy's no longer in Ephesus, the Apostle John ends up becoming the leader in Ephesus. And 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are written from that same perspective. We then see the final kind of comment about Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, where the letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus is one of the more memorable of the seven letters there in which Ephesus is told, I'm proud of you for your theological stances. I'm proud of you for standing up for what's true. Some of you know this, right? But I bring one thing against you. You have lost your, anybody remember? Online, type it in if you know it. You've lost your first love. You ever gotten into something which began with passion, focus, and love, but then you got so focused on details, theology issues, specifics, that at the end of the day, you won the battle, but you feel like you kind of lost the war because you lost that passion and focus and joy that was where you were when you first started? That's the story of the Ephesian church. Now we're dropping in right now. We're going we're to parachute in right in the middle of all that where Timothy is dealing with a couple of folks who are teaching theology that Paul doesn't agree with, that Paul calls out, says is wrong, says actually some pretty harsh things about it, and then directs Timothy to teach the Bible in certain ways. And as we study about what it means to teach the Bible clearly, but also about how to learn from the Bible, how to listen to the Bible, and then also how to live out the Bible. As we do that, we're going to drop right in the middle of that in 2 Timothy chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, open up there. Uh, we, will, we will jump right in. We are going to um, start in, in verse 14. And so that you know, in the second half of chapter 2, there are three big segments Three large segments that kind of define for us uh, what's happening in this text. The first one is, is I'm going to call the approved and unashamed worker. Uh, Paul is describing to Timothy the approved and unashamed worker. The second section is a simile, uh, a metaphorical talk that describes what an honorable vessel is versus a dishonorable one. Okay, honorable vessel. And then the third thing, Paul comes to the end of this chapter describing to Timothy what the Lord's doulos, by the way, the Greek word doulos is typically translated slave. In this particular text, the Lord's servant, uh, what, what the Lord's servant should be like, okay? It's full, like thick of good, solid teaching here in 2 Timothy 2. So let's jump right in. We'll read, and, and I'm going to do this one a little differently than normal. Instead of me reading all of the text and then teaching at the end, we're just going to take a verse, talk about it, take a verse, talk about it, and kind of walk our way through this. Okay, so we're in the approved and unashamed worker section here. Verse 14 says, Remind them... Uh, the them, by the way, are the, the, the leaders that Paul has already told Timothy to find and set aside and train so that they can lead in the future. So we're talking about mentoring, we're talking about developing and expanding the church's reach by growing other leaders. It's actually very much akin to where we are as a church right now. How do we grow leaders? How do we train leaders? How do we help move them to a place where God uses them in great ways? Uh, that's exactly what's happening. So that's the them. And the, so remind them of these things. Also, you'd have to look back, but these things means a solid Biblical teaching, okay? So remind them, the, the leaders you're growing up and about to release, of these things, solid biblical teaching, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. 
You ever been around somebody that just likes to fuss? Like they just like to, they just like to fuss, you know? They kind of get it into it, you know? They 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 minor on the I'm sorry they major on the minors you know like totally focusing on the little bitty detail that that they think is different in their mind than in somebody else's and they just like just like to fuss the truth is it's a temptation for a lot of us even for those of you earlier who raised your your hand and said I like to study. I would be willing to wager that for many of you, myself included, being the one who likes to fuss goes along with that love. It just kind of does. It's a temptation for us. So if I point my finger at you, my thumb's pointing back at me, okay? I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But, but Paul warns Timothy, listen, sometimes when you get people who love to study, they also love to bicker. They love to argue. They love to, oh, we use nice words. They love to debate, you know, and sometimes debate is great. Like I, I genuinely enjoy as long as I'm in a debate with someone else who wants to be in a debate. That's enjoyable as long as the attitude's solid, the love for one another is genuine. You know, like there, there's a sense of respect there that that can be a really good thing. But am I right, folks, that if you get into a debate and the other person wants to debate, but you don't. That can be problematic, right? Or even if both people want to debate, but then all of a sudden an attitude thing shifts or a level of respect for one another shifts. And all of a sudden it's not a debate. Quit using the pretty word. It's a fight. It's a quarrel. And it doesn't do anybody any good, right? If you've parented more than one child at a time, you know what I'm talking about get into a fuss or a fight over something between an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old, and you as a parent just want to go, what you're fussing about doesn't matter at all to anybody but you. I bet if I can send you to that room and you to that room in 30 minutes, neither one of you will even remember that it was happening, right? Those kinds of quarrels that are just useless. That's what Paul's concerned about. Paul's concerned that in the church of Ephesus, a church that is focused so much on change in theology, development of, of teaching and thought, a church that's had teachers who had uh, upgrades, if you will, on the new pieces of information that they're learning, that in that church, if we don't watch out, they're going to end up just quarreling. And that can happen. Get this. Two months ago, we brought people together from at least two different denominational backgrounds. We brought people together from at least two or three socioeconomic backgrounds. We brought people together from at least three counties where they live. Here's my guess. My guess is that in the beginning, we all get so excited about new faces and new ideas and new thoughts that it's easy to just not even notice differences and just move on. But down the road, my guess is that our temptations, once we become more comfortable with one another, once we get to know one another, the, 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 if we don't watch out, our comfort level might get to the place where it's easy to debate a little more freely. And if we don't watch out, if a debate is not welcomed or wanted on both sides, if it's not included with the right attitude and with the right heart, and if it doesn't have the right kind of respect uh, between people involved, then it could end up becoming a quarrel. So it would be good for us to heed Paul's teaching to Timothy even now that we don't want to have anything to do with senseless, useless quarrels about words which do no good but only ruin the hearers. Next verse. It says in verse 15, do your best. That, that's a, a Greek word that means diligence, like have diligence, be, be genuinely focused. Uh, to present yourself to God as one approved. Now, some of you like me, you memorized the certain parts of the Bible from the King James translation, didn't you? Anybody do that? I did. So when I, when I have this memorized in my head, what I have memorized is study to show thyself approved, okay? Okay. It's a great translation, very good way. Uh, the word study really does mean be diligent in learning and in growing. So it's not just like open a book and study, which is why these translators use the, tra the phrase, do your best. Because the, the idea really is diligence, not just direction to study. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed... 
That's why we refer to this section as the approved and unashamed worker, okay? Rightly handling, if you memorize from the King James, rightly dividing, right? Rightly handling the word of truth. That word that's translated rightly handling, it does mean to cut it straight. So we're talking about a a, a word here that describes in very practical ways that we want to make sure and get this right. Now, I love the tension here. Because the tension is, Paul is saying to a diverse group of people, you want to make sure you get it right, but you don't want to quarrel about it. (laughs) Do you see the tension? You want to make sure that you cut it straight... But we don't want to get involved in useless or helpless quarrels. And throughout this entire text, there is no doubt that there is a tension that exists between between standing for what is right and standing together. And we're going to see that over and over and over as we continue to read the text. Uh, One quote that I got this week from David Platt and Danny Aiken, uh, they said, the teacher who abandons scripture as the primary source of instruction will end up damaging people and creating division. This is because once a teacher leaves biblical revelation for human speculation, the final court of authority has been removed. I think that's really, really an interesting quote. To better understand that, let's keep going. Verse 16 says, but avoid irreverent babble. I don't think you need me to tell you this, but those those are pretty strong words. Like if you started talking to me and I went, those words coming out of your mouth, irreverent babble. That's not going to make you smile, right? Like that's going to make you, you're not going to go, thank you, Pastor Brad, for pointing that out to me. That's so kind of you to let me notice that my babble was irreverent babble. So don't let the big fancy words like make you read over it and not notice the tension because Paul just told people not to fuss and then he said they were involved in irreverent babble. This is just the tension I want you to catch on to, okay? Avoid irreverent battle, babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. I don't want to gross you out, but the mental picture here is the idea that within a living body, there can be something that's dead. And death is spreading to other parts of the living body. That's what gangrene is. Something inside you, even though you're alive, that's dead. And unless you get it out, it will continue to spread. And the death will become a bigger portion or percentage of the whole. Okay? Their talk, their argument, their fuss, their irreverent babble will spread like gangrene. And then he goes, among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Calls them out by name. Then he tells us what's going on with them. They have swerved. Um, some of you have heard before that the Greek word for sin uh, means to miss the mark. And some have even used the illustration of shooting an arrow at a target and the target missing, like just missing the target. It's not the exact same word, but it has similar basis. The idea of swerving is missing the mark, missing the target. Okay? So they've not hit the target. And, and to use his previous word, they haven't cut it straight. Okay, Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth. Now, then he points out the very specific area where they've swerved from the truth, uh, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. And then in verse 19, the scripture tells us this. Whoops, I went too far. But God's firm foundation stands. Bearing the seal, the Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the Lord... Who's, I'm sorry, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So Paul is laying out this reality where we're warned not to be like Hymenaeus and Philetus. Don't swerve from the truth. In doing so, you harm other people. You create gangrenous death in the life of the church. And ultimately, you cause all kinds of harm. That's, that's what he's saying about this important level of teaching. Now again... My point today is to talk to you about the goal of study, the the discipline of study. And every time you hear me talk about the importance of good teaching, my hope is that you would understand that if teaching is important, then so is learning. 
If teaching is valuable, then so is listening and so is living. So every time a teacher is told to cut it straight, the scripture is telling a learner to hear it straight and live it straight. Every time a teacher is told to get it right, a learner is told, is told to hear it right and live it right, okay? So that's the important factor for us to get, that there's the teaching, yes, but there's the listening, the learning, the living, that's so important ultimately at the end of the day. Verse 20, now we've stepped into the second section, the honorable vessel. Without a doubt, the most challenging section of this text to understand, well, no, it's not hard to understand. It's kind of hard to accept how blunt he is. Uh, then it's a little bit of a challenge to teach. And my goal here is to tell you the truth. And maybe together we can kind of laugh about it while all of us get a little bit of a lump in our throat. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the goal as we deal with this. Listen to what he says. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. This is where, if you don't know what that means, it would be pretty easy to miss. If you walk into a wealthy home 2,000 years ago in Ephesus, which, by the way, was an affluent town, the affluent would have had platters, chalices, those things you eat off of, those things you present to guests, those things you brag about, those things you hang on the wall and you let people see and you keep them clean and you show the world that they are the best that you have. That same large affluent home would have had clay pots, and wooden, uh, wooden things also. And so in all these things, these are vessels. In other words, they, they hold other things. That's a vessel. The clay pot, the wooden pot, the wooden vessel would have been used for other things. Like a dustpan, where you get the dust off the floor and put it in the wooden vessel, throw it out. Like uh, the place where you throw away the food at the end of the day and hand it to the dogs like the large pot that might have existed in the restroom. Okay? Now here's where it gets really interesting. There are the honorable and the dishonorable vessels that exist in the big affluent house. That's all he said so far. Verse 21 says this. I keep aiming in the wrong direction. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honorable use set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteous, righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I'm going to go back. So when I was talking to Stephanie and then the group of men I gather with and study through the week, uh, one of the things that was brought up was, uh, okay, what is this whole honorable, dishonorable thing? And why is it that the fancy gold and silver seem to be the goal here, whereas the, the, the stone and the wood seem to be thought of as, as useless or bad? Dishonorable being the specific word. And the first thing that a few different people brought up, they were like, hey, surely that doesn't mean that in God's eyes, the Christian who does the fancy, flashy stuff is more valuable than the one who's willing to get down on their knees and do the, maybe the, the hard work, the dirty work. Without a doubt, that is not what this is saying at all. In fact, within this simile or this metaphor, the Christian who's willing to get down and do the dirty work is metaphorically the silver and the gold. Am I making sense here? What he is saying, though, is that the Christ follower who only calls themselves a Christ follower by the fact that they're kind of associated with the church, but they're not dedicated to solid theology. They're not dedicated to true teaching. They're not either teaching what is right, cutting it straight, or they're not learning and listening and living out what is right. They may be a part of the household, but the way in which God is using them currently because of their investment on their end is less honorable than the way God might use someone who does dedicate themselves 
to his truth and his word and the life that he's called them to live. So what I thought about saying was, there's a truth here that's so direct that I just don't think I can say it. I just don't think I can say it because I don't think I would say it to anybody and I don't necessarily think there's anybody in the room that directly needs to hear it. I don't know who I would be talking to if I was. Uh, but but I, maybe I need to tell you what that truth is and then maybe you can tell me a nicer way to say it. Can we do that? The truth is, if you are not dedicated to knowing God's truth, to hearing God's truth, and to living God's truth, then you're not very useful to God. Wow. I would never say that to you. I would never put that on a slide up here for you to read or anything like that. But maybe you can help me find a nicer American way to say what God just said. Hmm. Wait a second. We get to invest in our usefulness. We get to have a hand in how useful we are to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying God uses some and doesn't use others. The, the, the passage seems to lean into God uses everybody. Some for honorable, some for dishonorable. Wait a second. The goal is also, I want to be used in honorable ways. So do you. I want to be used in honorable ways. So do you. Okay, so how is that? Well, the way that I can contribute to how God uses me in honorable ways is that I can make sure that I'm cutting it straight. I can make sure that I'm teaching what's right. I can be dedicated not only to teaching that which is good, but when teaching is not my role, when my role is study, when my role is learner, when my role is student, then I can make sure that I'm listening. I'm really listening. Not to what the pastor is saying, but to what the word says. I'm really listening. I'm really listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. I'm not just at church, but I'm in this conversation. I'm in this learning moment. I'm really, really listening. And I'm not only listening, but I'm also learning. I'm letting myself go, okay, wait a second. That really helps remind me of a truth I already knew. And I, I believe it even stronger now than I did before. Or, man, that helps me learn something I didn't realize was true. So I've got to shift some of the ways that my brain thinks about that. Wow, I'm, I'm listening, I'm learning. Now I've got some changes I've got to make in my life. I've got some things that I need to do differently. I'm going to live it. I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to learn it. But now I'm going to live it. You guys get where that's all of a sudden this becomes my pathway to a greater sense of significance in the way that the Lord uses me, I want to be used, you want to be used in a way that's honorable, not dishonorable. So let's keep going. You didn't laugh out loud, but I think we got through that part pretty well, okay? Jim laughed. I appreciate it, Jim. Thank you, sir. Verse 23. The third one is the Lord's servant. He says in this third section, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Once again, there's a big word that Paul loves to use. Paul is a great theologian, but man, he's direct. Okay? It's very blunt. Have nothing to do with, uh, have no, nothing to do with this kind of stuff here, this ignorant controversies. Uh, you, you know that they breed quarrels. In verse 24, he says this, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. We talked earlier about the difference between debate and argument or quarrel, and gentleness is a huge part of that. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Some of us have been there. I've been there. I've had close friends who were there, kind of captured by the snare of the day. In other words, in a place where for whatever reason, your anger or your bitterness or your depression or whatever seems to just drive every thought that runs through your mind and you feel trapped you want to get out you're praying that god get you out you hope your friends won't leave you there you want out but you're not sure how to get out 
from the flip side of that, sometimes your friends, those around you, might be thinking, I don't understand why this is so hard for them. I don't understand why they won't get over this. I don't understand why they won't move on. Those kinds of thoughts. Well, it's important for us to recognize that this, is, this isn't just a human frame of mind. This is a snare, a trap from the enemy. Sometimes, in some ways, he's got somebody. And it's not going to last for eternity. It's not even going to last forever in life. But right at this moment, they feel confined by it, incarcerated by it, trapped by it. And our treatment of them can release the trap. That's what he said. I'll go back to 25. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the trap, the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. We don't have the power ourselves to release the trap, but we can be used by God to be his tool in which he grants them this freedom. Man, that's important for us to get and so valuable. That's what being a servant of the Lord is is that our life is dedicated to glorifying him and doing his will, learning his truth, hearing his truth, living his truth, so that he may use us as a tool in the life of someone else. Now that's pretty honorable. I was studying for this as we begin to wind down here. We're really gonna focus on the learning, the study part for the next few minutes and we'll be done. Uh, One of the pastors that I I like and listen to, he took this whole text and he brought it down to seven things that he thought were uh, the most important things for us as Christians to learn from this text. He says, make sure that you have biblical fidelity. Fidelity is one of those words I don't use very often. I actually looked it up. I mean, I know what it means, but I always hear that word in more of like a financial kind of word, like like with my insurance or my retirement, you know, fidelity. That sounds like a good word. But fidelity here means like a real, genuine, honest connection to what is true and we're devoted to it okay devoted to it biblical fidelity means that i'm not just going to be opinionated about what i've always heard which is where most christians are i'm going to be devoted to knowing the truth so that i can stand with it i can let it guide me and it means i'm going to be a studier i'm going to listen i'm going to learn i'm going to live the truth healthy fellowship in other words i'm going to be a part of a good group of people who can help me in this. For those of you online, this is a really, really important factor. The thought of the the words of a sermon in and of themselves are not pure fellowship. The words of a sermon can be helpful. They can help you with biblical fidelity. But you need human beings in your life. Friends, family, most of you have those. But make sure you do. Make sure you do. Invest in those relationships. Pursue righteousness. That's the third thing. That we're, that we're, this is a pursuit. We're running from what's evil, running toward what is good. We have a discerning mind. That's, a, that's something that develops over time. All of a sudden, you begin to go, wait a second. That does not sound right to me. I'm going to step away from that. I'm not interested in getting in the wrong place. I love this gentleness and humility. I almost put those as one because they seem so similar. I'm going to be gentle to you because I'm humble before God. So if I keep my humility right with the Lord, then my gentleness with other people shouldn't be too hard to deal with. And the last one is, and Paul lays it out in the last few verses, that there's this willingness to confront evil. Willingness to say, I love you and I'm being gentle, but that you're doing is not right. We can't can't go there. We can't go there. And that's within the church, but it's also without God. So, kind of focusing on the end here, why do we listen? Why do we learn? If I'm going to ask you as a church to develop the discipline of the disciple that we call study, we need to know why. Why do we listen? Why do we learn? The first one is this. When you you really learn the word of God, it allows you to receive and reflect it. You receive it, like, oh my gosh, I'm learning. I'm really getting it. It's becoming part of who I am. But you also begin to reflect it. See, you've heard before, somebody said this to you, uh, this is an old adage, like, you may be the only Bible they ever read. Have you ever heard that before? 
I hope not. Really, I do I hope I'm not the only Bible someone ever reads. I really hope not. Uh, but if I'm going to be the only Bible somebody ever reads, I better make sure they picked up a good translation. You see what I'm saying? Like, like if their understanding of God is going to come from watching me, then I really make sure, I want to make sure that I represent him rightly. I can't represent God rightly without knowing his word. I can't. There's no way around it. I cannot reflect the word of God if I've not received the word of God. So I encourage you to be a man or woman who studies the word. That's important. The second one is of just three and we're done. Is that all of a sudden when you really, really become someone who studies the Bible, you will learn to reject worldly thinking. And here's where it gets kind of twisted, you guys. There are some things out there. I'm not going to get into what they are today. But there are some things out there that very closely resemble the truth that we just talked about and yet do not lead to glorifying God and edifying his people and lifting his name up. In fact, am I right here? The very best lie is not something that seems completely outlandish and all like over the top and in no way whatsoever true. The very best lie is the one that looks about 90% right and then just has this zinger at the end that takes you down a different road, right? That's how the enemy lies. There's no way in the world for an untrained Christian mind, for someone who has not spent much time in his word or has not spent much time with his Holy Spirit's guiding and directing of his thoughts, which comes from being in his word, there's no way for that person all alone by themselves to catch on to all the lies they're going to be told. There's no way. The only way is to prep yourself by being in his word, listening to good teaching, learning from it as you learn throughout the week, and then beginning to live it in the way you choose to, to live your life. That's really, really an important factor, and I want to make sure we all get that. The last one is, when you're someone who's got the discipline of study in your life, active and growing and maturing who you are, then not only will you be able to receive and reflect the word, not only will you be able to reject worldly teaching, but you'll also have the opportunity to restore the wanderer. The person who's caught in the trap, the snare, you'll be the person who God can use to help them because you'll know what they need to hear. It won't just be, oh, I'm praying for you. That's what we say when, I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing to say. It's a great thing to say, I'm praying for you. But sometimes if all we ever say is I'm praying for you, that just means I don't really know what to do here. I don't have any answers for you. And I really would like to find a way to get out of the awkwardness of this conversation and go somewhere else. I'm praying for you. See ya, bye. Now don't look at me like I'm the only person ever done that in my life. Because I know I'm not. Because lots of people have been praying for me. Okay? I know it. God doesn't just want us to have like a distant connection to him where we can throw up some prayers occasionally and hope they land. God wants us in an intimate, ongoing, regular, daily walk with him that involves studying his word, receiving it, reflecting it. That, in God, that, that a daily walk with God where we reject worldly thinking and, and helping restore the wanderer is not even something we have to work at. It just comes from who we are because we're filled with his spirit and filled with his word, reflecting it regularly. That's my encouragement to you, church. That's why it's important. Don't hear your pastor saying, go read your Bible because if you don't, God's mad at you. No. No. Well, God's already told us. He'll use us either way, with or without our commitment. But when we devote ourselves, when we allow ourselves to really listen to his word, to, to learn from it and to live it, then he has so many more honorable things he would love to do with us because we've prepped and we've submitted to him and been prepped for the things that he could do in our lives. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. And we don't always know 
the answers. In fact, most of the time we don't know them. But we do know where to find them. And so today I, I hope, Lord, my prayer is that this message, that the truth from 2 Timothy 2 would have been etched in our hearts, like heard loudly. Lord, I pray for the people in this room and for those listening online and watching. Lord, help them see that my goal, your goal, was not to make them feel, feel bad about something they've not been doing. Not the goal at all. But that you working in us are showing us, Lord, the potential for life with you. And the beauty, the importance, the value of what it means to really become a student of your word. Lord, we trust you with this. Our hope is in you. As we sing a song to you here in just a moment, Lord, uh, one of the lyrics is, Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Lord, I pray that you would help us to really embody that today as we learn about your redeeming love, as we begin to let it rest in us and, and become who we are, as we begin to reflect it to the world. Lord, we trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? Now, there are lots of ways that we respond to the Lord. Uh, we have, one of the reasons we turned some of the lights down was uh, this room can be pretty bright. We want to have people that, the freedom to maybe come forward to the altar area and kneel and pray. Uh, and and I, I, we don't want people to feel like everybody's watching, you know? And so uh, in the future, one of these days, we'll find a way to be able to turn a lot of them off at one time without having to throw the breaker switch. Um, we want to give people a little more animosity, a little moment to be by themselves. But between now and then, we're all friends, we're family. You are welcome and wanted at the altar. If the Lord has something for you that, that walking down an aisle and kneeling at a step gives you greater sense of commitment, then I encourage you to do it. It may very well be that God's guiding that. But there are so many other ways to respond. It may be that you need to grab the person you came to church with this morning and say, hey, let's pray together. Maybe there's somebody in the room that you just feel like, I, I need to make something right. I'm going to go stand beside them and just tell them that I care about them. It may very well be that the response that you need to have for the Lord is all internal and nobody around you is even going to know that it's happening, but that you yourself internally are making commitments, are, are responding to the Lord. We also respond to the Lord in our gratitude and in the way that we are generous. And so even though I know we, uh, we don't pass a plate or do that here, we respond to the Lord in giving. Some of you will do that by using the bucket by the door. Others will use the text where you text give to the church's text number and do it online. However it is that you respond to the Lord, let that be something that even now you are considering and thinking about as a part of your response to the Lord's love for you. Let's worship him. Let's respond to him.